Boy, that was wonderful, wasn't it? Well, am I on? Does this sound okay? Is it coming through? Am I on, Andrew? I am. That's great. Uh, this is why sound men don't care for me. <laughs> don't mess with the sound man or you're in trouble. Okay. Well, uh, I have a, a message that I'm very excited to talk about today. But before we get into that, I just want to say a couple of things um, about the other speaker. <laughs> and I want to begin by saying, you don't have to worry I am not going to resort to creating silly screenshots that make the other speaker <laughs> look really foolish. I notice he's wearing a hat this morning, but that, you know, I'm not going to go there. So you could just erase that one, Andrew. We're, we're not going to do that. that that's not going to the way it works. Because, truthfully... I don't know if it works this way with Renee, but when we work together and we do this banter back and forth, I'm up all night trying to figure out what in the world am I going to do for the first five minutes of the message. You know, the message took weeks to prepare, but it's the all-night vigil over how am I going to heckle Renee uh, in a godly, upright manner. And at five this morning, yes, at five this morning, it dawned on me, the answer is, tell the truth. <laughs> so I am going to share my favorite Renee and Bill story. I believe, looking at so many familiar faces, there are only three of you that haven't heard this story. But just humor me, because this is God's honest truth. This is really something amazing. I have been um, very uh, delighted to say that uh, Renee and Lori have invited Kathy and I to come and for me to speak at his church uh, numerous times over the years. And if you ever are in uh, the Santa Cruz area, the Bay Area, you need to go to uh, Twin Lakes Church, TLC. It's just a fantastic group of people, uh, as you would guess, from their pastor and his wife. So, so I get this opportunity to uh, come and be with uh, Renee and as is his constitution, he can't do anything without a little bit of humor and fun involved. So he comes to introduce me, and he begins by saying, we're very honored to have Bill Butterworth with us uh, this morning. Now, uh, if you don't know Bill, let me uh, tell you, I, I checked with his mother, and she uh, sent me a picture of Bill at his childhood. So, Andrew, put that picture up. <laughs> this is exactly what he did. <laughs> and he goes on, and, you know, Mrs. Butterworth says, you know, he was a darling little child. And, and everybody in the congregation is getting, if you're one of the three that don't get this, this is a child actor from a very famous Christmas movie called The Christmas Story. This is Ralphie. This kid's picture has followed me around my entire adult life. I carry one in my wallet now because everybody always goes for it, okay? So he's doing this deal, and he says, so now he's grown up. Now he's got a wonderful message. Please give it up for Bill Butter. So I get up there, and I give my message. And when the service is over, uh, I go to the narthex, to the lobby of the church where I have a book table set up of my books, and, and people are asking me to sign them. So I'm signing these books, and this dear woman is waiting in line, and she's got a stack of books a mile high. And I always can scope those out, because that means we'll eat for another week. And um, I'm so excited. This lady comes up, and she's got stuff for her kids and her cousins and her uncles and her aunts, and, and they love that movie, you know. And so she's got me signing all this stuff, and then the moment of truth comes where she leans in and whispers in my ear, are you still acting? <laughs> and I look up at her and I realize she's being legit. She thinks I'm Ralphie. 
grown up. And I'm like, uh, you know, that was just kind of a little skit kind of thing that Renee was, what? You're not the actor? And I'm, now I'm signing books faster because, you know, I'm smelling a refund, and you're not going to get a refund if I already gave it to Uncle Charlie, you know. I wrote his name. you got to give it to him. This is your... And, and then she says, honestly, she goes, Pastor Renee lied to us? <laughs> and I'm like, yes, he did. <laughs> So, during the week f between that and the next Sunday, or the, it wasn't really the next Sunday, it was some time after, right? It wasn't just two weeks in a row. But anyway, I'm starting to get uh, emails from uh, Renee and from his assistant, Val, and, and she's saying like, man, we, um, we had a little uh, situation here. The, the, there's a woman who was really upset, and she's sending emails to Renee, and, you know, she's, she's just steamed that, you know, all this dishonesty would be going on. And she's, I'm just telling you, boy, it was really hot and heavy here. So I come back for a return visit. I don't know how long, you know, but um, Renee is gone, so we don't have to worry about any fake introductions. But... I'm, I'm there, and um, I'm sitting on the front row with Kath, and all of a sudden, uh, a guy, I think it was the guy you said you went to Disneyland with, Welty, he comes down from the balcony, and he says, um, I got a message from Val, I got to tell you right away. I said, what is it? He said, the woman who thought you were Ralphie is here today, and she's really ticked. <laughs> and he goes, I think she's sitting right behind you. And I look behind me, and there's this older lady. I don't recognize her, but I think he's right. I think this is the woman. So I'm in the service sitting on the front row like these guys are doing here. And I keep kind of looking to my back thinking, you know, I'm scared. I mean, how, how angry is this person, and how, how violent, you know, could this become? So I get up. And I, I start off my talk, and, you know, I, I can see her out of the corner of my eye over there, which means I'm going to work this side of the room a lot. And I'm, like, working this side of the room. And, and so because I'm working this side of the room, I see out of my peripheral vision, which doesn't include my glasses, and we already established yesterday, that's no good. I'm blind. But I can see an object, a, a, the body of a human being, heading up the steps coming to the platform. Now, people often ask me, are you ever nervous when you speak in front of people? That was the time, because I thought, and then the other thing is, I can see she's, she or he, whatever it is, has something in their hand, and I'm convinced it's a gun, and I'm thinking, I'm going out. This is all I always kidded about. If I have to die, I just want to die between point two and point three, you know, and just just say a prayer. You know, it's like, uh oh, she's coming to get me. And lo and behold, I finally turn and I look, and God bless him, it's a um, it's a mentally challenged young man who is bringing me a bottle of water because he thought I sounded like I needed a drink, and I thought this was a gun. I thought he was a woman. And finally, I turned and looked, and you never saw a guy hug another guy over a bottle of water as good as possibly. I mean, it was amazing. So just a little PS on the thing. Now the service is over, and um, I say to Kath, I'm going to go upstairs and find Valerie. I got to find out while she sent a guy down. Saying, She's really, you know. And so we go find Valerie, and Valerie says, oh, no. He got my message all turned around. I told him to come down and say to you, hey, the woman who thinks you're Ralphie is here, and she's not angry anymore. This is great that she's here. And I'm thinking, well, you could have made that more clear about 90 minutes ago. I'm in adult diapers up here. I can't believe what's going on. So anyway... 
That's enough heckling for Renee, but just remember, I tell the truth, all right? I tell the truth, nothing but the truth, so help me God, all right. So yesterday when we were together, we learned about the church entering what I called its awkward adolescence, and I began with my ride in the convertible with the hat duct taped to my head, and um, I'd love to give you the impression that that's the only silly thing a teenage boy named Butterworth would do in his life. Uh, we really never did anything illegal, but we did some pretty silly things. Uh, Teddy, Bobby, and Billy. Bobby was the one guy in our group that was a year younger than us. And so uh, my senior year of high school, Bobby was a junior. And Bobby was wild and crazy. And he and I made a pact uh, early in high school that, um, how's this for a noble teenage goal? We both wanted to graduate being named the class clown of our class. And so we would perform in between class at the spot where all the, the kids would have to walk by when they're changing classes. We would, we would tap dance and end by, he would jump into my arms and then the next day we'd tap dance and I would jump into his arms and, and we did all kinds of silly things. And one of the best little bits that we had was Bobby and I became very good at impersonating mannequins. If we weren't dancing and in one another's arms, we would stand for the entire seven minutes between change of classes just <laughs> and never move for the entire seven minutes. And we were so full of ourselves, we thought, this is so good, we need to take this show on the road. So in Philadelphia, here, here's something, here's a couple of words you haven't heard in a long time. There were a lot of department stores. Remember that? Concept department stores, all right? A lot of famous ones in Philadelphia. John Wanamaker, Lit Brothers, Strawberry and Clothier, Gimbals. You know, Bobby and I went to John Wanamaker, and we decided that the, the windows of the store where they had actual mannequins were boring because the mannequins never moved. And so we proceeded to hop into the storefronts and just start doing our little mannequin thing and we thought it was great because crowds were gathering and that would bring in business. And I thought John Wanamaker himself might come over and shake our hand. He'd been dead for 100 years. But nonetheless, you know, we thought we were really good. Well, the manager of John Wanamaker didn't like it. And he uh, booted us out of the showcase windows. But you know what? We were convinced that we were doing something really significant, contributing to our society, and that we were going to be people that were going to be remembered in a kind and favorable way for these sorts of things. When in reality, I believe the manager's words were the same words that my parents said when they found out. It was the words, grow up. You're a teenager. You're going to go to college next year. What are you doing playing mannequin in a department store? Well, I don't know that James or Paul or Peter or Barnabas ever said grow up, but it's implicit in the idea that this was a young church that they are addressing, especially James when he's talking about this. So, let me uh, begin with just a review of a couple of things we said yesterday, why growing up is important in the book of James. Number one, James wrote one of the first books in the New Testament. Chronologically, to me, that's a very important point. Wrote one of the first books in the New Testament. If you buy the traditional dating of the life of Jesus, he's died and resurrected in 33 Acts chapter 1 happens in 33. The book of James is dated between 45 and 50, which puts that 12 to 17 years beyond the birth of the church. So you have a church in its awkward adolescence, okay? Secondly, the church was in its awkward adolescent years, okay? 30, uh, 45 to 50 A.D. And I had mentioned to you yesterday on the human side, when you're looking at teenagers in their adolescence, three things that I feel are very important are boundaries, room to grow, and grace and integrity woven together. Now today, for example, we're going to see how God institutes boundaries in our lives so that we can understand, as the little cliche goes, that God is God and we are not. 
a, a teenager is oftentimes so full of themselves, it's like, man, I'm just, I'm going to do it my way. You know, get me Elvis or Sinatra. We're going to do it my way. And that, on one hand, that's, that's wonderful for their courage and their, you know, their passion. But on the other hand, it's like, well, you know what? God has a say in how all of this is going to go as well. And we're going to get into that today. No matter where you are in your Christian maturity, whether you're a newborn, whether you're a teenager, or whether you're an old person, spiritually speaking, we all know that God is still at, in, at work creating boundaries in our lives. There have to be dozens of people listening to this right now that are in some sort of test or in some sort of trial or in some sort of tribulation. And it might be the best kept secret in all of Cannon Beach, or it might be something that everybody knows because they read about it online every day and anywhere in between. This is the way God works, and we're going to see how that happens in this passage. And then number three, the gospel of God's grace doesn't cancel the need for obedience. It doesn't cancel the need for obedience. Grace and integrity go together. And so what we see here is number four, James pleads with his adolescent readers to grow up and put your faith to work. Put your faith to work is where we ended yesterday. The Council of Jerusalem took place, which I, I you know, kind of cynically called the Global Leadership Conference, okay? Everybody was there and with their buses and their hotel rooms and their book tables. And the message was, you don't need to add anything to the gospel in order to be saved or to stay saved. Okay, it is faith and faith alone. Paul goes home and eventually writes the book of Galatians that emphasizes keep your faith pure. Don't be, I love the term he used, don't be bewitched by anybody who's going to do any kind of false teaching. Don't be bewitched by them. Let, keep your faith pure. James goes home and writes the letter of James saying, Put your faith to work. Those of us who may have thought in the past as a good Jew that we needed to keep the law and be holy and be upright, faith alone is not an excuse now to go out and do whatever you want. It's not a license to sin. You are still being asked to be a holy, upright, righteous person. In order to have a relationship with Jesus? No. In order to get into heaven when you die? No. But just because faith would work as it grows. As you grow up, your faith matures, and we begin to see it more and more. Okay, so with all that in mind, we are ready to talk about what we see in James chapter 1. Now, I'm going to give you, you know, these speakers, they love uh, alliteration and everything begins with the same. I have no less than four T words to kick this thing off this morning. You just write them in the margin and we'll get a place for them in your notes. Trials, tests, temptations, triumphs. All of that is in uh, the first few verses of James chapter 1 that we're going to look at this morning, all right? So what does growing up look like in the book of James? Well, it starts right out with this point. Point number one, growing up includes tests that will strengthen my integrity. Tests that will strengthen my integrity. James 1 one, James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes who are dispersed abroad, greetings. I always love that Bible letters always start with who it's from. Any of us that still get old-fashioned letters, don't you hate you have to go all the way, scroll all the way down to the end to see who this is from because the email address is fuzzywuzzywuzzabear.com. And it's, I don't know anybody named Fuzzy Wuzzy Was a Bear. You know, you got to go through the whole email. Oh, it's Frank, that crazy fuzzy bear. James said, hey, look, you don't have to read the whole thing. It's me, all right? And I'm writing to you. I love verse 1. Why, don't, why we lost that, I don't know why. Number, verse 2, consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. There's the first T word, trials. And it says, consider it all joy. Now, I'll be honest. I have done more messages out of James chapter 1, verse 2, than maybe 
any other passage, it's, it's got to be in at least the top five because uh, I love the power of this verse. And I would always go to, you know, it's joy and you are experiencing it. It's not if you experience trials, but when you experience trials. Whoever told you that once you know Jesus, you will just skip through the garden of life without a care in the world gave you uh, the wrong scheme of things. The Christian life will include difficulties. And for my purpose today, I'm saying as a good parent of a teenage believer or teenage church, the, tr the trials are good because it helps you see the boundaries of your own capabilities. Renee's talk is so perfectly uh, woven into what we're talking about this week up here, too. I mean, the two go together so well. God has made a masterpiece of you, and so you need to understand that that will include kind of smoothing out the rough edges. And so you will have tests that will strengthen your integrity. And the, the other thing that I tended to always skip over until more recently is verse 2 where it says, consider it all joy. Some versions say pure joy. Because for years, I would always talk about, hey, trials are like a good news, bad news joke. You know, the bad news is it's a trial and it's going to be intent. But the good news is, you know, God's going to use it and it's going to be, uh, you know, make you joyful. Well, that's an inaccurate interpretation. It doesn't say that tests are a good news, bad news joke. It says tests are a completely good news joke. There's no bad news to it. Now, that'll really rock your world. Go home and say, hey, man, I broke my arm. Hallelujah, break the other one. <laughs> you know, we're just not wired that way. But he's saying, you know, what you're going through right now, every one of you, what you're going through right now, didn't catch God off guard. He's not, whoa, I can understand why you're hurting. I would have never approved that had I known. <laughs> That's not the way God operates. He knows what you're going through. He knows how difficult it is, how you feel like this one's going to break you. This one's going to absolutely send me to my grave. You know, God knows. God's going to help you. Because look at the pattern here. First of all, verse 3, the testing of your faith produces endurance. Okay? Now, I love the old King James. Testing works patience. And it's an accurate definition as well. And so, you know, I'm a happy guy to include everybody I can. Fill in the blank. Testing produces enduring patience. How's that? I got them both in there. Testing produces enduring patience. I'm, you know, patience is a red flag word for me. I mean, I'm so poor at it, even at this stage of my life. You'd think I had learned to be more patient. I was more patient as a child than I am as an adult, which is a pretty sad thing to have to admit. And But I came to it honestly. I remember um, asking my mom one time when she was still around, you know, what, what's one of your earliest memories of me as a child kind of doing my thing or whatever? And she says, oh, that's easy. I remember when you were uh, just a little one and... Um, I mean, I'll, I'll tell you, this. there's a point to this story. I'm not trying to be just stupid. Uh, I remember when we were trying to toilet train you. And uh, back in that day, back in 19, when you would toilet train a child, the, the operation was there was this little wooden chair with a white plastic bucket in the middle and a little white seat belt. And you would seat belt the baby to the toilet until they did their thing, and then you let them go. You gave them their dog treat, and boom, they, they were on their way, right? So my mom's got me in this thing, and she's sitting by me, encouraging me, you can do it, Billy, you can do it, Billy. Come on, Billy, you know. And all of a sudden, we hear this horrible sound uh, out in the front of our house. And my mom runs to the front of the house to discover my dad who had been working on the roof of our house, fell off the roof. My dad's in a heap in the front lawn, and my mom panics. 
I mean, this is way before 911, but she comes back in and she calls an ambulance and, and an ambulance comes and, and they kind of revive my dad and they put him on a stretcher and they, they put him in this ambulance and they invite my mom, does she want to come with? And she goes, yes. And so she jumps in and my mom and dad go to the hospital. I think you're one sentence ahead of me in my script here. <laughs> And I'm seat belted to the potty train toilet. And my dear mom, God bless her, she was so upset about her husband, which, which I can totally understand, completely forgot about me for hours, hours. Now, depending on who tells the story, when my dad was alive, he said it was for days. So I came into this, Butterworth always expands and exaggerates a story. You know, honestly, I got it from my dad. But finally, my mom, she calls a neighbor, and a neighbor comes over and sets me free. And, and my mom says, but you know, the, the neighbor was so cute because she said, um, man, Caroline, I got to tell you something that's really cute. You know, uh, I walked in, and Billy was just sitting on the toilet, just kind of singing to himself. <laughs> Just the picture of patience, right? The picture of patience. 38 weeks strapped to that seat. And she finds me just, nah, 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 nah. but she says, what was really funny is I, I unbelted him. And before I could get his little pants up, I got to tell you, he had the cutest red ring around his little bottom. And, and mom says, I remember because it took a long time for that to go away. Um, and so whenever I think of patience, I always think, you know, if you need help with patience, if you get there, we're going to offer you what I call the red ring of patience. <laughs> it's an award that you will get that will teach you. And so you'll never forget it. We even found, if you can bring it up, here's a picture of me about that time. Now, is it me or is that just the tiniest little red ring coming out of that little butt? Um, bottom, buttock, sorry. Um, anyway, and plus, that's why I look constipated. But anyway, we're back in James 1. Testing produces enduring patience. Uh, it is, it's very similar to that cliche, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. You in something really heavy duty right now, God is using it to strengthen you, to help you see he's God, you're not. It's a boundary that he has created in your life so that you understand I can't do it on my own. Now, remember what we talked about yesterday. What was one of the big deals yesterday? That ever since the church began, they now have the Holy Spirit and his power living within us. It would be possible to start becoming arrogant by, oh, look at all the stuff I can do now. Well, it's not you. It's the Holy Spirit working in you. And so this is a very important teaching to that early church, and it's very important today to us. So A, testing produces enduring patience, and B, enduring patience produces godly maturity. Enduring patience produces godly maturity. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know how tough the decision-making process is in your life right now, but I know there are records in Scripture of men and women who were faced with very difficult choices to make. And they ended up putting their patience to work, putting their faith to work, which produces the patience, and the patience produced godly maturity. As a parent, there is no stronger test of my character anywhere recorded in the Bible than when God asked Abraham to offer his son as a sacrifice. Hold, hold your place in James and go back there for, with me for just a minute. Genesis chapter 22. Genesis chapter 22. This is the story of God asking Abraham to offer up his son. Just a real quick look at that in terms of patience and endurance and godly maturity. Verse 1. It came about after these things that God tested Abraham. So there's no question about What's the motivation? Why is this happening? It's from God, and it's a test, just like we're reading about in James 1. 
God tested Abraham and said, Abraham, Abraham said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains in which I will tell you. Okay? So the first thing we see, if you want a little mini outline in Genesis 22, number one, God tested. Number two, Abraham trusted. Verse three. And so Abraham rose up early in the morning. Okay, stop right there. Notice between verse 2 and verse 3 is nothing. No pause. No, and after many days. Or once Abraham sought counsel. Or months later when he came to his senses. That's not the language in that. There is no language. It's God tested and Abraham trusted. You talk about godly maturity that's, that's above my ability at this point. Are you kidding? Not even giving it a thought, just doing what God said. And you know the story. He offered up his son. God miraculously said, I just needed to see that you would do that. We're going to take care of this. Go down to verse 12. He said, do not stretch out your hand against the lad. Do nothing to him. For now I know that you fear God and you have not withheld your son. Number one, God tested. Number two, Abraham trusted. Number three, Abraham did not withhold. And number four, God provided. Verse 14, Abraham called the name of the place the Lord will provide, Jehovah Jireh. This is where God showed that he would take care of us as we respond to him. Boy, that's that's a tough lesson to learn. But that's part of the process that boundaries, that tests, that trials teach us. So if you go back to James chapter 1, what we're seeing in those beginning passages is that growing up includes tests that will strengthen my integrity. Now, secondly, we see number two, growing up includes learning that yielding to temptations will weaken my integrity. Yielding to temptations will weaken my integrity. Verse 13 begins, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. Each one is tempted when he's carried away and enticed by his own lust. And when lust is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. Now, this is where all the T words are really significant. If you're into outlining and indenting and all that sort of thing, there are two major points. A, trials, and B, triumphs, which we haven't gotten to yet. Under uh, trials, there are two subpoints: tests and temptations. And James differentiates them very clearly. Tests come from God to strengthen and mature us. Temptations do not come from God, and yielding to them weaken our integrity. Okay? Now, for years I would read that, and I would think to myself, well, James has very clearly left God out of the picture when it comes to temptation. He's saying, don't say, oh, God made me commit this sin. No, he didn't. You did it on your own. And it raised the question in my mind, well, Where is God in all this? What is God doing while I'm being tempted? And fortunately, 10, 12 years later, Paul would answer that question in his first letter to the Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 12 and 13. You want to look at it with me? 1 Corinthians 10, 12 and 13, and then we'll come back to James Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. What a great way to start. When I say, well, I I gave into that temptation because nobody's been tempted like this. I mean, you hear about there, but this is is world-class temptation. No, 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 no. It's just like everybody else. It's, It's common to man, and God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but will the temptation provide, with the temptation will provide the way of escape so that you may be able to bear it. You may be able to endure. Okay? So, 
What is God's role? God will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able to resist. He will offer you a way of escape. Now, one other thing that's very important to understand about temptation that people miss, they just, and it's, it's fairly obvious, but it's easy to miss, and that is there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with being tempted. All of us are tempted regularly. The issue is, do you yield to the temptation or do you hold it at bay? Don't think there's something wrong in your life when you think, man, it just seems like I'm being tempted all over the place. Now, it might mean you need to kind of radically change the way you're going. I mean, if if your problem is pornography, well, get that website off your computer so that it doesn't come up every time you log in. I mean, there's some common sense that's involved here, right? But the temptation did not come from God. It came from either Satan or from you. And the issue is not that it's there. The issue is what are you going to do with it? Are you going to yield to it or are you going to resist it? Okay? And he's telling us, as uh, chapter 1 continues, each one is tempted, verse 14, when he's carried away and enticed by his own lust. And when lust is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it gives forth death. That's point B under number 2. Lust leads to sin and sin leads to death. Now, the reason that's important is that James is essentially uh, mimicking uh, one of Jesus' points in his Sermon on the Mount. It was Jesus that said, hey, you have heard that you should not murder people, but I say when you even think of a person in an angry way, you're just as guilty as a murderer. And you've heard other people say, You should not commit adultery. Well, I say to you, when you look at someone else with lustful thoughts, you are committing adultery, and it all begins in the mind. Lust leads to sin. Sin leads to death. Ultimately, death meaning separation from God. And so what we're trying to understand is that we need to have boundaries around how we operate our lives, that God is going to bring things into our lives to teach us, and our own lust and Satan is going to bring these things into our life to see if we have a degree of integrity or if we're just kind of fooling around. So with that in mind, before we go to uh, this final point, let me just read a couple things to you that I just jotted down and see if you can figure out what's going on. When you were an adolescent, and if you happen to be one or two of them that are here right now, what were trials in your life when you were an adolescent? I just got cut from the team. Uh, My sweetheart broke up with me. We've been together since the fourth grade. I didn't get accepted in my first choice of a college. My dad took a promotion, so we're moving to another state. And I'm just not accepted by the crowd of people that I want to be accepted by. Standard teenage trials, right? And I would call those tests, okay? Just like adults have trials. I just got laid off. I've inherited or contracted a disease. I lost a lot of money in a poor investment. I'm having relationship problems. Adult tests, just some, they're myriad. But then it might go a different way. Teenagers might have this kind of temptation. I got caught cheating on an exam. I um, stole some stuff from another kid's locker and got caught. My parents don't know, but I'm hooked on drugs. Those are not tests from God. Those are yielding to temptation. Adults face the same thing. I cheat on my taxes every year. I I pad my resume. I'm hooked on porn. I'm having an affair. You can't blame those on God. That's not God's initiative 
That's our own messed up yielding to our own lust. So when those things come, it's like we've got to draw the line and say, I'm going to learn from these trials, from these tests, and from these temptations. And in doing so, we get the final point, point number three, and that is growing up includes triumphs that encourage me. Triumphs that encourage me. James chapter 1, verses 17 and 18. Two of the most uplifting, upbeat, positive verses you'll ever find in all of the Bible. Verse 17 says, Every good thing bestowed and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. In the exercise of his will, he brought us forth by the word of truth so that we might be, as it were, the first fruits among his creatures. Okay? Subpoint A everything from him is good and perfect. Everything from him is good and perfect. Don't miss the obvious. And the obvious is we just came through a passage that talks about enduring some of the most difficult circumstances in your life. What's the most common human response to testing and trial and tragedy? God, where are you? Why didn't you keep me from this? Where are you, God? And God's saying, where am I? I'm at the helm. I'm helping steer you through what it is that you need to learn through this crisis, okay? It is a good thing. It is a perfect thing. That takes a maturity to accept, right? We're not all there. We're saying, boy, this stuff is tough. I don't understand why I have to endure it. But then again, I don't understand why God does a lot of the stuff he does. That's why he is God and I am not. Everything from him is good and perfect. And secondly, number, or letter B, we are his first fruits. Now, I love that because we've got uh, the, the language of uh, the farmer. Look at um, chapter 4. Is that right? Where did I have that? I, I went right by that. Yeah, no, 5, chapter 5. Verse 7, and uh, be patient, therefore, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. Behold, the farmer waits for the precious produce of the soil, being patient about it until it gets the early and late rains. Farmers illustrate patience. Every good farmer is wearing the red ring of patience. All right? Because he realizes, I can't plant it Monday and go dig it up on Tuesday to see how much it's grown. I got to be patient and leave it in the ground and watch to see if God will choose to bless it and let it uh, flourish for us. And when it does, then we go back to James chapter 1. The, look, in the exercise of his will, he brought us forth by the word of truth. I'm in verse 18. So that we might be, as it were, the first fruits among his creatures. First fruits was a very common thing, especially amongst the Jewish uh, agricultural community in the Holy Land. When your crop came in, the very first thing you did was pick some of it and take it and present it to God. So it's literally the first fruit that you picked. But also, you never, ever, ever would think, so kids, go pick me some of the damaged fruit that we won't be able to sell in town. We can get rid of that. Just send that over to the temple. Let the, let the rabbis deal with that. No, you not only picked not the worst fruit, you picked the finest fruit. First fruit meant first fruit and best fruit. And I, I just, I was literally, I got chills last night when Renee was talking about the Ephesians passage. You are God's masterpiece. You are God's first fruit, best fruit. You've been beating yourself up for years like, oh, I can't do anything. I can't do this. I can't do this. Okay, join the club. My list of what I can't do grows by the minute. Every time we have a conversation, I find out something I can't do, you know? Oh, I love you, sweetie. I appreciate that. You're really good about helping me see. I, I, I really am, you know, the village idiot here. But if I can find one or two things that I can do, I need to really work on those so I can be the best fruit in that particular area. Do you know what that is in your life? Stop putting yourself in situations where you can't flourish. 
you know, I, I think I'm finally going to take my car to a mechanic because I don't even know how to get it out of park. It's how let alone fix, fix the engine. Good move. God didn't gift you as an auto mechanic. Figure out where you belong. Now, I mean, there's some guidelines, I'm sure. I'll never forget, I spoke at a men's retreat. And um, it was not just a men's retreat. It was a men of law enforcement treat, uh, retreat. It was all police men. Happened to be all men. And the guy that was leading it, as a kind of a icebreaker, get acquainted thing, said, so where are the guys who have never been to one of these before? I want you to stand up. And one by one, they would say who they were and what their rank was and what police force they were with. And this guy, while they're saying their name, would think of an insult to give them. Well, you're the stupidest little crazy person, you know. And everybody, ha, 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 ha. It was like a hazing of a fraternity. And who else we got? Here? Oh, yeah, yeah, well, let me tell you what. What, did your mother dress you? Kind of a Don Rickles thing. I mean, just ridiculing people after people. And I remember I went up to him afterwards, and I just said in unbelief, I said, man, that was really something. And I'll never forget his response. He just kind of smiled, and he said, it's a gift. <laughs> And I, I just wide-eyed, drop jaw. I'm not even going to go anywhere with this. I just say, okay, well, thank you. You know, can I get somebody else to introduce me when it's time for me? You know, I mean, ever, so there are certain things that you may do well that might not be your ultimate calling in life. You, you might not be. Uh, but don't forget, you're God's masterpiece, and that's a very important thing. So let me give you some wrap-up on uh, today's message with... Um, how to grow up and have integrity in your own life. Number one, ask God for wisdom in making right decisions. Ask God for wisdom in making right decisions. We, we skipped right over this, but look at verse 5 of chapter 1. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all men generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. This is kind of a New Testament version of Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him. He will direct your paths. If I lean on Him, He will show me the right decision to make. Number two, focus completely on Him. Verses 6 through 8 talk about the double-minded man. The double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Di sukos in the Greek, one who has two minds. That doesn't work. Jesus also addressed that in the Sermon on the Mount. You cannot serve God and man. You've got to make a choice. Stop riding the fence. Put your faith to work, okay? And then number three, I'll commit to learn from Tests, temptations, and triumphs. Where are you kind of weak these days? You're getting tests. Are you fighting God on it, or are you trying to learn the lesson from your test? Is it temptations? Are you just yielding like a crazy person all the time? It's out of control. You need to get some help. You can yield. God, uh, I mean, you can avoid yielding. God can bring a way of escape so that you don't have to be constantly yielding to that temptation. And then finally, are, are you triumphing in who you are? Do you have any idea that you're God's masterpiece? Do you have any idea that you're God's best fruit from the whole harvest? Wow. You're the best fruit from the whole harvest. That's a good last line. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the power of James chapter 1. Thank you for how it teaches us so many things. And, and this, this adolescent church in need of these questions being answered. Thank you for giving us the wisdom from the book of James. This dear man who wrote this letter to clarify some of these issues. Dear Lord, we love you so much. I pray for the person that's in this room today that's feeling the test in a big way. I pray that today's words might in some way be comforting and encouraging to them. I pray for the person who's being tempted, feeling like it's beyond what we are able to 
resist. Pray that they would lean into you and realize you're offering them power, the way to escape. And Lord, may all of us rejoice in being the best fruit of the harvest. Help us to learn from you exactly who we are as we study this in the evening as well. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Everyone said, amen.